Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for um, our panel here. Uh, we're we're joined by a number of panelists um, to talk about the growth of payments in automotive. Um, you know what we're seeing is kind of a a, 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 a growth of now the new payments experiences driven by new consumer behavior, a proliferation of innovation and in payments technologies and the emergence of new digital services within within the vehicle and you know auto OEMs are exploring these broad ranges of of services to in introduce to the vehicle which which include now subscriptions for vehicle services um, in vehicle payments um, payment processing for for subscriptions for e-commerce and so we wanted to explore this topic and we've brought together here on this for this panel a number of experts across a, a, a variety of other um, industries to discuss this growth of, of payments and payments capability. Uh, we're joined here today by Mark Gerben, who um, handles connected car strategy for a major OEM and was formerly with Apple, working on Apple Pay. Um, Olivier, Be Olivier Bessie, uh, managing director of FinTech for Star. Uh, Dan Strunk from WorldPay, um, Senior Enterprise E-Commerce Business Development Manager. Uh, Joseph Perry from Sony, um, Director of New Media Distribution. And Mulham Shalabi from Discover, General Manager of Emerging Payments Partnership. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining the call. Thanks for having us. Thank Great you. to be here. Yeah. yeah thank you, John. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just dive right in um, to the first question here. Um, so we're suggesting that there are growing payment needs at the OEM. Uh, is this actually true? Is this something that we're actually seeing? So maybe, Dan, can you? I'd be happy to take, take on question? the first one. Uh, yeah, this is a real easy one. I'm happy to take this one and Mark can handle the, the difficult stuff. Uh, to answer the question directly, yes. Uh, the need for payments and vehicles has grown exponentially, I think, in the last five years, right? Kind of during and after the pandemic with, we saw the explosion of, you know, curbside uh, pickup, parking, you know, fuel tolls. I mean, there's just a, a, a bigger emphasis, I think today on the needs for payments and, and vehicles. I'll kick it over to Mark. Oh, lucky me. So I'll, I'll make a very quick disclaimer that everything I say here is flat out my personal opinion, has nothing to do with my employer, all that good stuff. Um, so to get into it, actually, um, I would easily say yes. Uh, payments obviously is, is taking a much more significant role um, as we've seen um, with a variety of different services. Um, so for example, we've seen uh, last year with BMW, with them wanting to launch uh, now a subscription service uh, for you know heated seats. Uh, and then other types of services we've seen with other OEMs that are starting to come. Um, I think another piece that hasn't been spoken as much, at least in the US side, um, but more so on the European side is authentication. Um, so there's also a lot of stuff there uh, with regards to customer authentication, uh, identification at that point as well, so that you really have a, you're meeting those PSD2 requirements, which is, has its own plethora of rules, you could say. Um, but that adds a significant, um, let's say, layer to the user experience that you have to consider in a vehicle, right? So, great, and 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 I think you know some of these things where uh, you know paying for heated seats is is really more of a test, right? To to potentially see what customer acceptance is like, and you know what are some of the other factors that are that are um, contributing to the increase of this this payments. Um, you know, are, are, are there these services or, or content and maybe some, something Joseph, you could, could, uh, weigh in on, um, are you seeing, um, kind of increased interest in, in content services within the vehicle? Yeah, specifically as it relates to content services, there's several factors that are, I think are driving and contributing to the need for payment services. Um, as you mentioned, there is definitely the need for entertainment. Uh, but there's other things. There's data plans, there's service bundles, there's uh, other types of 
uh, driving services such as tra uh, traffic um, alerts, and traffic subscriptions, and all of those are being powered, I think, by two things: EV adoption, and I think higher technologies that are also being contributed to um, the growing need for data services inside the grid as well. Great, Mark. Any any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree um, in general because there's basically a plethora of different things that could be offered. Um, so um, in vehicle entertainment, it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, kind of kind of get some maybe some inspiration from other industries and travel. Um, you can take a look at, you know, the airline industry how they kind of tried to crack that nut for a little while um, with having in-flight entertainment. And you still have some types of charging that that does occur there, um, where you kind of have it as like a standard now. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that I think for, for those specific models makes to total sense. Um, I would get into some parts like with the experimenting piece. Um, so you're taking a look at a lot of the companies that are like, oh, let me, you know, charge X amount per year for a little bit more, you know, uh, engine power or whatever it might be. And some of this doesn't really make sense. Um, I, I'll literally sit there and go, you know, you have a subscription model. Um, that does fit certain scenarios. So if I'm talking about leasing, um, if I'm talking about something like this, I, I would do something like that there. But it doesn't make sense that if I buy a vehicle and I have it and I'm put on a subscription model, I don't know where some of these people are getting these pricing from, but I think the industry has a lot of, a lot of work to do uh, with regards to how they should package things and how they should, how they should think about things. Um, quite simply because you know when you think about ownership, that's basically what a person thinks they have. And then they're having something tied to, you know, something that's really physical that should be working all the time. And all of a sudden someone has the right to turn it on and off is it doesn't sit well with me. Yeah. 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 And, and we, we kind of want these, these features and, and the subscription to really be more, you know, driving that loyalty, driving, driving the pop, profitability, investing in these systems to really kind of continue to have, the, the 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 customer base um, want to return, not not drive the customer away. Olivia, is it, can can you talk a bit more about you know how you can actually use payments you know for profitability and customer loyalty? Yes, no, absolutely. I think that's that's uh, there's multiple ways we really in which I guess OEMs and others can um, can leverage uh, leverage payments to to drive um, uh, to drive their own their own objectives as well. I mean, I think the first the, the the first area which is probably the most obvious is the the, the simple um, user experience, and that's probably the starting point for most where you're going to provide like uh, essentially in car payments um, uh, capability in the car. So with all the I guess the ease of use uh, that comes with it so that um, that of course that imp improved UX is going to reflect well uh, ultimately on uh, on your brand uh, and kind of provide pro provide a delight delightful experience and therefore uh, you know hope, should hopefully result in um, an additional loyalty but I think it goes goes beyond that I mean one uh, one particular area for example uh, is it's going to be a um, an enabler for other services and I think we've touched upon that in terms of your know, subscription services Services, you know, I agree that I think the um, so certainly there's some um, some progress to be made in terms of identifying which are the right the right use cases. But you know, certainly things like entertainment, uh, etc., seem like the right the right area to look at. Um, the um, I, I think it's also potentially a way of growing uh, growing revenue by uh, by itself. So in particular, um, some uh, uh, some of the players in the industry are looking into or have already done uh, so issuing. Cards. So in that, in that case, for example, if you issue cards that you can use to pay for EV charging, for uh, for petrol, for for other services, then uh, you will generate uh, interchange revenue for um, uh, for yourself as the uh, as the issuer. You will uh, you will generate you know, potentially some additional revenue via um, let's say your your affiliates network that you may work with, uh, and then you you of course you're going to generate data, which is uh, something that you're going to be able to leverage uh, in the future to, uh, to better uh, better know your um, uh, your customers uh, and and finally I would say that the, the last area I think is probably slightly more indirect but it's also a way of uh, for OEMs I think to to help their 
their their dealership network and you know we see by by helping them uh, they're, they're helping themselves by essentially uh, giving them better solution for uh, acquiring services uh, things like um, uh, marketplace or e-commerce and essentially kind of a way to, to give new, new relevance to the to, to the leadership great and are are, are you can we talk about what um, services you're, you you are seeing as being successful um, and f financial financial fintech type services that are being successful now? Um, you know, we've talked about different services. Um, we always talk about parking. We always talk about these other. Words. But what what are these what are these areas that that we're really um, beginning to see traction? I know Mercedes, for example, has launched Mercedes Pay. Um, Joseph, you're 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 um, looking at digital services for OEMs, are we starting to see success across some of these digital services? Mark, would you like to go first? <laughs> I can, if, unless, well, either way, I can go with um, really a really basic starting answer that the industry is starting to see traction, um, for sure. Um, traction for me means that, you know, compared to a few years ago, there was zero. Now there's something. Um, something I won't mention because, you know, those kind of things are a little bit confidential, but let, let's just say that I think that that's starting to, to take some form. Um, I think part of the issue was, is that the user interfaces and experiences were flat out horrendous prior. Um, they really had like multiple steps, uh, registration on 15 different devices, jumping in and out, like none of that made sense. Um, now we're starting to see a lot more of a like a mature market where you have bigger screens, you have more things that you could actually use and interact with. So it's not like you're programming for like, you know, remember the phones we had years ago where the screen was like this big, you now have something that's much more significant. And this means that you can have completely different experiences that start to actually be customer friendly. And so um, when I take those aspects in, um, I would take a look at really the vehicle basics, things that actually make sense that are very vehicle specific. So we're taking a look at fueling, uh, parking, we can take a look at charging, car washing, for example, anything that's just 100%, this is what a vehicle does, right? Um, those are the kind of services that I would be looking at and starting with versus um, I, think, I think other aspects as well, like we're taking a look at um, in general, what I'm saying there is more like with charging, for example, you have these long wait times. So I think entertainment is going to have a huge push in a few years when the industry starts going up in this way. Um, so I, I, that's a good springboard. Maybe Joseph, maybe you can talk a little bit on that side for you. <laughs> yeah. So I think a couple of things are happening. So I agree with everything Mark is saying and the fact that up until recently, there wasn't a real case or a logic for consumers who want to pay inside their vehicle. So to, to that point, that there has to be value for the consumers to want to make these to make transactions in the vehicle, and that has driven the adoption or the need to have payment services with good user experiences. Uh, some of the things that that we haven't really talked about, like data plans. So, for example, ADOS requires data, and up to this point, OEMs have been ultimately covering the cost for all of those types of services. But those services are expensive and they're continuing to grow. And as we bring in more technologies into the vehicle, such as being able to have immersive entertainment experiences, then the costs are gonna to continue to go up and more data is gonna be required to be used inside the vehicle. So there has to be a way for consumers to pay for that. And, and there's three things I always say. It has to be easy for engagement, easy for the consumer. You have to make it safe and then you have to make it fun. I think those three things are the things that we're working towards and we're not there yet. Um, right now, uh, to Mark's point, we're at just doesn't work. You know, can, can you actually make the <laughs> transaction work? And I think the next level level is uh, it's got to be the right services that make sense. And it's got to be easy for them to do that. And then, we, and then we'll get to the point where it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes easy is in, is, is in conflict with safety and fun. And so... Uh, balancing those three things in, in in automotive can 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 be tricky, but I, I I do I do think the platforms in the vehicle or or what you're starting with is 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 truly making it easy, uh, as 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 Mark said, and and hopefully we can get to get to fun quickly and 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 always safe. Um, 
So, so what are some of the challenges, Moham, maybe we can um, turn to you real quick here. What are some of the challenges that the OEM might face when, when kind of implementing new payment solutions for customers? I mean, you, you're, uh, Discover works, you know, with, with customers every day. Um, you know, what are some of the, what, what are some of your thoughts on, um, you know, how um, these new payment solutions could be, could, could be um, made, made easier for, for customers? Oh, Mahalam, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, to to your point, I think you know there's there's a lot of challenges that OEM, not just OEM, but I think anyone in the payment uh, space faces when exploring new payment solutions. And to me, for me, the number one thing is customer adoption. Uh, being able to uh, you know launching a new payment solution, but then getting the consumer to use that solution is key. So we know today consumers are already using payment methods that work for them today, uh, whether that be traditional payments to uh, wallets or different things regarding that. So really understanding your uh, customers' needs and having a uh, having parity across the card brands, offering different digital payment uh, and mobile wallet solutions to really offer that robust payment offering to the consumers is one way um, I also want to talk about just a few trends that we're seeing in the space today. I'll touch briefly on them. Uh, I mentioned mobile wallets. I think mobile wallets, uh, as we know, is becoming they're becoming more and more popular and uh, different reasons for that. There's uh, trends, uh, I think, from the uh, pandemic that have caused folks to use more digital and mobile wallets and uh, making it easier from that ang angle. But in general, it's just easier sometimes to use a mobile wallet versus going directly to purchase a view, some purchase something online. Um, and consumers are using these different uh, methods today to purchase car-centric products. So, uh, you know, as we know, the payment industry has seen a consumer shift to digital wallets and a significant uptick since the pandemic. And a study we did with 451 Research shows that digital payments are expected to account for more than 10 trillion in global transactions between in-store and e-commerce by 2025. So we know the consumer buying habits continue to shift. So being able to understand your customer and, and helping them along the customer journey by offering different payment options at various points um, of that journey is valuable. Uh, and we continue to see this trend continue as more consumers are demanding a frictionless experience for their shopping needs. Um, I'll just touch briefly on a couple other things. Um, I mentioned flexible payment options. You know, being able to create a strong customer journey and loyalty is really a, a, a solid way to provide that customer experience by meeting the demands of the customer and creating more digital experience, like I mentioned, making the consumer uh, experience seamless at the end of the day can really help drive some of those customer adoption uh, for new products. Uh, one thing that we, as I think of from just thinking about in-car payments and how to drive more adoption to that, uh, as in car, you know, looking as the vehicle as a payment terminal, uh, you know, loyalty programs and reward programs can be ways that have been used in other in, this, in other verticals that can be something that can be implemented in the automotive space potentially to drive customer adoption. Because loyalty programs rewards tend to retain customers and affect uh, really get their in consumer interest and capture their spend as well. So that could be a potential uh, way to think about when it comes to trying to get adoption in new payment methods. And uh, the other thing is like embedded finance solutions. We're seeing new ways that merchants can offer uh, new payment experiences through different platforms that go beyond the traditional platforms that we know of today. So for example, in-car payments, even social media, being able to uh, understand the voice of the customer, understand your your, your customer journey and, and their needs can be a, a really great way to, to help drive that adoption and offering flexible payments. So for example, we're seeing buy now, pay later uh, is continuing to be in high demand. Uh, offerings uh, a consumer who may not have made a purchase for whatever reason, uh, using an option as buy now, pay later to make that purchase. And we're seeing that uh, grow into different retail categories, including uh, automotive from a parts and services standpoint, and uh, definitely can see that continuing to expand in the automotive space. Uh, so to summarize, it, you know, I think as OEMs look to add new payment solutions, understanding the latest trends and payment solutions uh, to help address the biggest challenge is customer adoption. I think that can help with that. Thanks, Mulham. Um, Dan, do you want to add, add to that a bit in terms of uh, like, I, what I, are those challenges? Right. I feel like Mulham just like absolutely crushed that. So uh, I'll try to follow that. Uh, but there are a few things, uh, challenges that that are exist like 
connectivity, coverage, and reliability, right, from, from a nation perspective or a global perspective, right? Um, for example, in uh, autonomous driving, you don't want the system, you know, or you don't want the connectivity to fail uh, in, in, in a situation where the car is, is driving you. Um, some other things that to keep in mind too, regulatory guidelines and how they vary uh, as well. The subscription payment complexities of because the app is on the dashboard doesn't necessarily mean the OEM will be the merchant of record, right? So understanding who would be settling those transactions um, and, and who would be then responsible for, you know, that transaction data and things um, along with, you know, cybersecurity and consumer, you know, privacy, a lot of those things you have to think of as well um, as you're implementing new payment solutions, especially uh, for the OEM. So, And then, so so how do, how how can OEMs partner with like a financial services company like yours? Uh, reach out to me. Uh, I'll send all everyone <laughs> my contact information. I'd be happy to. No, in, in all honesty, um, it, it starts with having that conversation, looking at what you know whether a merchant merchant acquirer you know like WorldPay can do what we have available today, uh, but then also creating those partnerships. So we connect, you know, the right solutions, um, you know, with the right OEM and those kind of things. So uh, I, I would say stressing, you know, partnerships would be the biggest thing. Reach out to, you know, I'm sure every bank relationship has a merchant acquiring relationship that you could, uh, you know, reach out to and start that conversation um, to understand what's available today. But then what can be partnered together to develop for those solutions for the future. Right. And and maybe we should turn a little bit towards security and, and and security of those those payment transactions. Olivia, what 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 are what are what are some considerations they need to make, or or how how might their this service might be different than, than just a traditional digital service? If 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 OEMs need to make customers pay for them, maybe can you give us an overview of of some considerations around? This securing of those payment transactions and 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 what steps that that OEM should should be thinking about. Of course, um, and um, I mean, obviously the uh, the cards and payments uh, industry is governed by um, by standards called uh, called PCI DSS, which I uh, I won't I won't inflict the, uh, the the details of you on, but I'm not sure. Maybe maybe Dan will. Um, but um, but essentially the, um, the, uh, the the core the core of it I would say is is largely around how you how you handle uh, essentially card uh, card details such as you know the, the sixteen digits card numbers and the the other details of the uh, of the card I think the the, the, the the core of it is that you you want as much as possible not to not to handle and certainly not to store the um, uh, the card details and I think uh, Mulham uh, mentioned uh, I guess the the the, the growing importance importance of uh, mobile wallets and, and this is really uh, at the core what what mobile wallets are enabling you to do so they're essentially enabling you to pay using a card uh, but without uh, without um, uh, storing or handing over your um, uh, your card number so I think there's there's obviously various technologies behind that I mean clearly the uh, the, the ones um, initiated by um, Google and Apple for their own presents some uh, some differences but they're essentially based on um, either for example tokenization of the um, uh, of the card number or some uh, some other if you like encryption method um, so so, so typically I would say an in-car payment solution would would involve some sort of uh, some level of yes the tokenization to avoid um, storing the card number obviously you don't want to become let's say uh, an organization that that uh, uh, that if you like stores all of your um, uh, all of your cost customers' card numbers. Um, the there there are, for example, for things like subscription services, there are dedicated um, you know, third parties who do things like card vaulting. Uh, again, so you, that's something that you typically want to outsource to uh, to a third party and not not you know, necessarily handle you know, handle yourself as a uh, as an OEM. Uh, and I would say finally the third layer is how do you uh, how do you um, manage access uh, to um, to, for example, authorize a uh, payment. So here you have more 
I would say, biometrics uh, focused solutions. So that this could be, uh, you know, it could be face recognition, it could be um, uh, fingerprints. So I think various various providers have kind of made various technical choice, but I would say that's kind of the last the last layer on the cake is that that kind of biometric access. You know, how do you how do you authorize access to to the payments? I don't know if Dan, you want to, to add some, some details as well from your perspective. The only thing that I would add is exactly partnering with those third party like fraud tools, um, you know, for machine learning or the AI security monitoring that they have uh, just from a fraudulent transaction perspective um, that can help as an additional layer as well. Uh, but no, Olivia, you really took it home. I don't want to I don't want to bore everyone with PCI uh, questions. Great. Um... And let's, so, you know, as as OEMs begin to focus on 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 payments, you know, what are what are some of the other strategies that we should think about? Uh, Moham, maybe you can um, um, address this. Just the strategies around um, the go to market complexity. Um, wh what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think there's 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 quite a there's a lot of different uh, strategies and complexity, but I'll, I'll touch base just on, on on a couple really quick. Uh, so we know as like as we look as across the board in different verticals, we're seeing a variety of approaches to including payments, and there's no right answer. Uh, you know, there's there's different approaches that uh, OEMs can take, but uh, you know, one approach that can allow an OEM to move more quicker and more efficiently. Uh, can be potentially through like the payment facilitator model. So one approach we've seen uh, that we that we see more frequently that partners are opting to uh, look at is the payment facilitator, also known as merchant of record, is becoming more and more popular. Uh, prior to payment facilitators being around, it was necessary for a merchant to connect directly to an acquirer. But with payment facilitators today, businesses can onboard onto their platform, and then the payment facilitator merchant of record acts as the go-between connecting into the payment processor directly. So newer technology and software providers are continuing to add new, more payments to their solutions and uh, just in, in new and exciting ways. And companies have found that they can scale faster uh, by implementing payments on more platforms. And in a multitude of verticals, uh, we're, you know, we're seeing some people moving to the payment facilitator model. And some reasons is you know, ease, ease of signing of partners, uh, you know, doing it from a cost perspective or scalability perspective. But what makes the solutions really intriguing, intriguing is having more control of the experience for your customer and providing a simplified payment experience. As I mentioned before, and I think we've touched base on it, the value of the, the consumer journey continues to uh, evolve. And uh, having the ability as a consumer to make a payment uh, using whatever payment method of, of choice, but then throughout the process, whether it might be in a store, uh, on a mobile app, online, e-com, or even in your car, and as or to different different approaches from there, uh, being able to help uh, control that and, and solve for that is is key. And uh, we're starting to see some of these trends come into the automotive industry, uh, you know, being adopted in the difference from dealerships to in-car payments, e-com, parts and services, proximity, wallets, subscription services, mobile apps, and more. And I think uh, Mark had mentioned on subscription services, uh, you know, one thing that, you know, we're seeing more and more than even the auto manufacturers are starting to do is launching rentals, uh, subscription services where you can rent a vehicle for a month or a week. Uh, to to uh, sometimes maybe your lease might not your your lease might be up and you're trying to you're in between buying a car whatever the reason may be but you're seeing more products and more services being introduced uh, in in the automotive space and you know Mark also talked about uh, the new the new payments from proximity and being able to add more merchant verticals into the vehicle um, I, I think it's the the customer journey is just evolving and and being able to solve for that is is uh, is critical. And then really just want to touch base on one other strategy. I think partnerships, you know, we, we're all on here today uh, just having this great conversation talking about you know, payments and automotive. And we know in the automotive industry, uh, the automotives are the automotive industry, they're the expert in automotives and, and payments are experts in payments. And if we can bring that together and have more collaboration and work closely together, uh, I think that's, that's critical in uh, solving like-minded uh you know goals as well as more importantly for our consumers thanks moham mark joseph what, what do you think about the go-to-market complexity and and uh, you know are we are we is that improving anytime soon well 
Yeah, I actually think it is improving. I think that um, with each new model and each new update and each new release that comes out with a vehicle manufacturer, you're seeing more capabilities that allow for these kind of great experiences. Um, it's great for people like me. I'm a, I'm a content producer. You know, we make movies, we make TV shows. And one of the things that we have to think about is when we want launch services um, that are going to be bringing content inside the vehicle, we have to think about, first of all, how do we launch it without having transaction capabilities? But then what comes after that? And so the runway to be able to, to get that is there now. We can see it now. I think the manufacturers are thinking about it from a global perspective, how they can make that operate. And so I think all these things are timing, um, are occurring right at the right time. And I do think we're going to get there. Um, but I agree with the idea of partnerships that um, all of us hold a piece of information that we're experts in in our particular space. And bringing all of that together to the table allows us to come with really good solutions. Great. Mark, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, there, there's one part that no one really thought about, I think. Um, and it more or less comes to the point that, um, you know, the automotive side is one thing, uh, the customer is another. You know, those are two entry, you have a, basically a, a technical piece over on the OEM side. You have a customer acquisition piece on the wallet side if we're talking about wallets, right? Uh, and then we're talking about the content provider side who has to do the work to bring their, their content into the vehicle. And um, one of the biggest problems I see uh, quite frequently is that, um, you know, especially with, with payment work, uh, that all the payment rails and everything have to be completely redone with wallet scenarios. So that basically means that each time, um, if I want to have some content that is basically would plug in, that's great. But then, you know, there's a question of who's merchant of record, who's going to do this, who's going to do that. And that creates so much more work. And a content provider's like perspective is, is to reach as many users as possible. So it's super easy uh, from, an, from a phone perspective, because a phone has billions of users. You've got, you've got Android and you've got uh, the App Store, right? So from those two points, that's super easy to, to reach. But when you get to automotive, if I'm taking a look at the resources, what, what's the bigger business case? It's obviously not a automotive, like at least for a lot of content, because it's like, you know, in the end uh, for, for an OEM, they have maybe a few million customers and, and literally in comparison to billions or hundreds of millions of, from, from other scenarios. And that from at least a content point of view is not enough exposure. So I think like a lot of the, the business models and also the prioritization for the resources to get stuff done just doesn't really happen like across the entire board uh, nearly as fast as you would have in, in mobile. So I think that that's a, a huge part that at least to this point, to this day, um, there's very few scenarios or solutions, even, even stuff that can scale up much quicker um, than I'd say traditional methods. Um, still can't address as, as well as, as they could. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, we're, 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 seeing, we're seeing automotive platforms like um, Android Automotive and, and what uh, BlackBerry is doing with Ivy, um, making things a bit more common across OEMs, which you know, hopefully will, will, will help with that scale. Um, mm -hmm. But in, 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 and hopefully help with the, the security and privacy. So, so to a certain degree, there's, there's this balance that needs to be taken. You know, are, we, are we taking too big of a hammer to the security and privacy aspects? I mean, now there's going to be transaction data that the OEM now um, will be um, potentially um, having to manage. You know, what is that balance between you know, security and privacy and convenience and accessibility of these services? Like, what 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 is that right mix? Um, or, uh, is that something that OEMs really need to kind of be worried about, or are they um, moving too slowly? I mean, is this Mark? What, what what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I would say from from the get go, it really depends on the OEM because some OEMs have much, let's say, more relaxed policies than than others for sure when it comes to, to data protection or consumer data. Because if you're talking about, let's say, um, let's start with the high-end premium models, right? They, they, it's really um, affluent individuals. They prefer their privacy. Um, they don't want to be tracked, that kind of stuff. And in that sense, you have to have proper constructs, which makes sense uh, for that demographic, right? Because they've paid, an ex an, let's say, a very high premium to have that premium vehicle. 
Um, on the other side, you have um, lower end models that are for, you know, could be for the kid that just got out of high school or who knows what, right? Something really, really low cost. And those companies have to think a bit more outside of how, how can they actually generate revenues based on the fact that they have very, very little to get go because like they're, they're there to produce a vehicle, it has very little margin. So they're depending on massive volumes of sales. And if they don't get those volumes, they got to get their revenues elsewhere. So I think from, from that perspective, that's the first major piece that has to be considered. Um, thereafter, it really just depends upon, um, you know, the demographics. So uh, I think the, the demographic of, of each individual group is going to define what kind of services you're going to offer. Um, so let's, let's take a look at, you know, the budget car. If it doesn't have a big screen um, and it doesn't have a lot of other stuff, I might want to use um, a bigger focus on Android uh, Auto or, or CarPlay because it'll have a better overall consistent user experience in a small scenario. But if I have a luxury vehicle scenario, which has like, you know, massive screens, I have everything everywhere. Well, all of a sudden my engagements points completely change and I go, well, why do I want to put all of my stuff in a small little box? Or even if it's, you know, if it's changed a little bit more later, that control for that experience is standardized and standardized basically means that that's not luxury. So if people are not getting a luxury kind of scenario uh, or they don't have like a premium experience that doesn't fit that that target group. So I think that that's a really big uh, area that needs to be kind of like thought about because sometimes standardization, yes, helps with scale, but you have to also look at standardization that still has a high level of customization. So it still fits like the look and feel of the product. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is something which I think across OEMs is, is actually coming in from bottom up rather than a kind of real kind of platform view. Um, any thoughts? Any thoughts on, you know, uh, that technical strategy or that that approach? I mean, is it really something that OEMs, because they're they're just trying to sort things out, should they be, you know, creating individual services across different groups, or should they really start thinking about this as 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 an overall strategic platform for themselves? Yeah, I mean. I guess that kind of dovetails a bit. So sorry if I hog the time here, but um, I think it has to do a bit with the fact that um, the data itself creates personalization. Um, so it's a question of how you use that information to create like the different cohorts and your ecosystem within your ecosystem. So you have like different uh, segmented um, aspects. So for example, if I know that I have a large majority of, of children uh, who drive, who sit in the back seat, and I'm delivering content in the back seat, I can use that data to deliver content. So I think, Joseph, maybe for, from your side, you'd probably be able to confirm that if you have certain types of information, you're able to confirm certain types of content delivery. W would you say that you've seen that also in other, other lines of business? Yeah, absolutely. You can identify from profile segmentation and consumer attributes based on the type of content they're watching, how long they're watching it, what they start, what they watch trailers for, what they don't buy and transact. We can build all kinds of information about a consumer based on that level of engagement and activity. So it does help to fuel customizing and personalizing those experiences at, within a vehicle, as well as the recommendations and the searches and what is displayed and exposed to each individual user. Great. Well, we're coming up a bit on time here, so I wanted to thank everyone. But before we leave, um, any last bit of advice that you would let an o, you know would want to tell an OEM who's starting to kind of really consider payments and and how that might um, dif make differentiate and, and and increase profits for them, Joseph. So uh, you know, I think one of the things that I always mention is that. Um, you do have to start right now. What are your what are your immediate needs right now? But I think it's very important that manufacturers, as well as all of us that support the industry in our various capacities, think what does that midterm roadmap look like? Because that will really drive how you develop and shape and some of these technology strategies that we've been discussing. All of that becomes very important in terms of where you want to be, how soon you want to be there, and what are going to be the different methods um, 
and types of currencies and all those types of things, especially when it comes to payments that you want to have. And then lastly, thinking about your user experience across all these different models, everything from the starter car to the, the premium car. So those types of things are very important and will allow you to create those solutions. But you have to think about it um, in contextual um, discussions with all those different pieces and not just do it in silos or in one particular uh, box. Great, thank you. Dan, how about you? Abs absolutely, I would I would uh, ring that same bell as Joseph said of, of partnerships, reaching out, creating that collaboration uh, between those financial services partners, uh, the OEMs or the technology providers as well, um, because it's going to it literally take a village um, to, to get this thing done and get it over the line uh, in a big way. Um, as Mark touched on from like the user perspective, a much smaller user base when you think of automobiles versus uh, you know phones, but phones had a much smaller user base 20 years ago as well. So you think about that kind of 20 years into the future, and I absolutely see kind of the adaptations that happen to the smartphone for a payment wallet perspective being able to be implemented into the kind of the car dash of the future. So reach out, partner, however we can kind of continue the conversation, I think is, is the best thing we can all do. Great. Thanks, Dan. Mark? Yeah, I mean, one, of the, one of the main pieces um, I think I'd offer as advice for most uh, OEMs is that they need to get like a lot more uh, specific on their payment specialists. Like they don't have a head of payments at a lot of, a lot of these companies. Most people go, who is doing what and why? And um, I feel quite often I see just a huge lack of expertise. Like I think it's an understatement when I literally say that, but a huge lack of expertise in um, payments. And, and that basically means that, you know, a lot of the strategies are literally, oh, what are the other guys doing? You know, let me see what they're doing across the street and get that information. Oh, they're using this provider. Oh, that's what I've got to do because it might make sense. And it literally doesn't. So um, most of the time, um, I think we really have to look at uh, if there's going to be a massive improvement and a, and a huge change on that side, they need to have um, really a lot more people who know what they're doing in the space um, because you have literally people who come from production to running digital operations and then getting into payments and going, oh, you know, it's no problem. I'll put someone on there. Yeah. And they have no idea, no idea, right? Yeah. So um, that's, I think everyone in here could probably laugh about it because it's so true. You see like the, the level of discussion you have, you cannot get into the depth you need to have let alone when we start talking about authentication and all this other good PSC2 stuff just becomes a nightmare. Um, MPCI, right? So that's just that's yeah. the, the well, fun little stuff. Yeah. I guess there's the piece that there is an operating part of this business, not just the integration of an API to make payments work. And, and, and having the understanding that there's a whole operational aspect that needs to be considered um, and ongoing maintenance and PCI and security and all of that. Um, so yeah, that's that's um, that's that's that experience that's that's likely missing. Exactly. Thanks, Olivier. No, I think I think uh, obviously uh, I'm going to concur with uh, everything that's been that's been said so uh, so far. I would I would simply add. I mean, say very clearly, very important to have a, um, a strategy as as to what you want to achieve in um, uh, in payments. Uh, so I, I think whether uh, it's largely largely driven by um, improving the user experience for um, uh, for your your users, or whether it's to to drive you know potentially um, uh, incremental revenue. Um, to, um, have uh, have partnerships, have, uh, have have more data. So I think to, it's important to nail down the objectives. And then I think in terms of actually product, I think it's important. To, I'm going to put my kind of a product manager uh, hat on. It's important to keep it simple. So it's essentially um, when uh, when launching the first uh, the first product, to to not necessarily try to tick all uh, all the different boxes. Uh, maybe focused on uh, a few key use cases, which uh, you know are very important to your um, to your users, to to the consumers, and do them as uh, as well as you can. Uh, and as, essentially, that enables you to have probably a much I guess a simple Simpler and cleaner AI, rather than to try to do you know everything under the sun and you know end up with something that's you know potentially potentially over engineered, and then you can address the the additional use cases later. Um, essentially, you know iterate uh, and um, and handle it that way. I would say. 
Great. Thank you. And Mulham? Yeah, what everybody just said. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'll just, I'll just, I'll just leave with this. I, yeah, everyone made some great points, and it, and it really comes down to partnerships and you know collaboration and have exploratory conversations with companies that you may have not thought in the past. And you know, one thing that I, I really love about working at Discover is, you know, as you know, we're we're very nimble and easy to work with and uh, you know, would love to have more and more uh, partnerships and opportunities to talk with you know, different, uh, different uh, automotive partners in the space. So yeah, just, you know, just really just building on those partnerships and, and it's the best way to learn about, e about each other and, and ways we can solve for solutions. Great. Well, thank you everyone for, for joining the video, um, the, the panel and, and, and recording this video. And, um, we hope that it was uh, an interesting discussion for everyone. And you know, if, if there are questions from the audience, we will we am happy to route those questions to to the panelists afterwards and, and connect you. Um, I think everyone's here, um, kind of open open to meeting new um, new partners. So thanks everyone.